let's start with a quick show of hands. How many of you here like taking afternoon naps? Good God, I'm in so much trouble today. I mean, not it's about 12 o'clock. Right? The benefits of these naps are well documented. Right? Let me add a little known benefit to this list. Assume you are a US investor who regularly takes afternoon naps. The chances of you getting a cardiac arrest on the 6th May of 2010 would have been significantly lower than somebody who doesn't take these naps. Sounds interesting, right? Here is why. 6 May 2010 began like any other normal trading day in the US market. Market was up a bit, down a bit, nothing much that we hadn't seen before. So let's say you took your beauty nap at 2.30 PM and then woke up at 3.30 PM, right? What happened to the market? The market didn't do much, right? So there's nothing much to worry about. However, if you had stayed awake during this period, this is what you would have witnessed. Around 2.30 PM, the markets crashed dramatically. The Dow Jones Index, which is a proxy for the financial health of the stock markets, fell by a massive 9.6 percentage. As a result, over $1 trillion of investors' wealth was wiped out. Let's put that number in perspective, right? $1 trillion is twice the combined size of Singapore and Hong Kong. Twice the combined size of Singapore and Hong Kong economy was wiped out within 15 minutes. You should have definitely taken that nap, right? However, if that sounded strange, what came next was even stranger. In the next 15 minutes, the market recovered and went back to where it was earlier, as if nothing had happened. Right? This crash is referred to as a flash crash. It has been six years since the crash happened. During the past six years, we have learned a, lo learned a lot about this crash. These learnings have, in turn, fundamentally enhanced our understanding of the financial market. These learnings are by no means specific to the US market. Some of them apply even to the Indian market, where we are assembled today. So it is some of these insights that I would like to share now. Let's start with a simple thought experiment, right? Assume that you are sitting in a bar. Right? That's a good place to visualize yourself in right now, right? So you, you've got a nice window corner, for, corner seat for yourself. After some time, you see your friend stepping out. Where would he be 10 steps later? Or let's say 15 steps later. Of course, it depends on the amount of alcohol he has consumed, right? Let's assume that he has consumed a lot of alcohol. It's going to be absolutely difficult to predict where he would be 10 steps later, right? This path is often referred to as a drunkard walk or, in statistics terms, a random walk. Many believe that stock prices are like drunkards. It's very difficult to predict their future prices. So what is it that we can predict? Let's revisit the bar, right? So now, after stepping out, the drunkard, our friend, unchains his dog, and they both start walking. Like before, it is very difficult to predict where our friend would be. But there is something else that we can predict with a lot of confidence, right? The distance between the dog and the drunkard. Assuming the drunkard did not treat the dog badly, the dog will always stay close to the drunkard no matter where he wanders off. Stock market is full of dogs and drunkards. Not literally, of course, right? What do I mean by this? Now, let's say we have two stocks, Google and Poodle. Poodle stands for poor man's Google, something that I made up. Right? So don't look for it in Bloomberg or something like that. So the key assumption here is that both of them belong to the same sector, have similar business models, and hence, their prices are driven by similar factors. Not surprisingly, their prices track each other. Now, let's assume that over the next two periods, the price of Poodle falls while that of Google remains stagnant. The question is, what is likely to happen in the next period? Before we make the call, we must obviously scan news outlets for any information relevant to Poodle. Let's say we do not find any news or information that would justify this dramatic crash in price of Poodle. Perhaps it's just a temporary aberration, and eventually the prices would converge. What we are essentially betting here is that the Google and Poodle, or the dog and drunkard, would eventually converge. This is what is referred to as pace trading, as we are not looking at stocks in isolation, but in groups of two. Let's make it a bit more realistic, right? 
if all that I'm doing is tracking these two stocks, I'm going to spend a lot of time praying that they would eventually diverge because unless they diverge, I don't have a trading opportunity, right? However, if I were to track three stocks, I can now work with three pairs. If I were to track 100 stocks, simple algebra tells us that I can work with close to 5,000 pairs. My opportunity set immediately explodes. However, with great opportunities come great pain. It's almost impossible for the human brain to simultaneously process information about 5,000 pairs. This is where algorithms step in. An algorithm is nothing but a series of instructions to a computer. Right? It's relatively straightforward to ask the computer to do the, do the following. Read prices of various stocks, identify the pairs that are moving away from each other, and for the ones that have really moved far away from each other, place bets that they would eventually converge. This is referred to as algorithmic trading, a practice where algorithms scan the market, identify opportunities, and execute trades, all with no human intervention, right? So it's very important to clarify that pace trading is not the only algorithmic trading strategy, right? Now, let's make this a bit more interesting now, right? Let's add a bit more color. What will happen if I were to put these algorithms on drugs or hallucinogens, right? What I get is what is referred to as high-frequency trading, something that I'm going to talk about now. Let me start with a very simple illustration. In U.S., stocks are primarily traded in New York and New Jersey. However, contracts that are tightly linked to these stocks are traded in Chicago. These contracts could be simple bets on whether the price is going to go up or down. Given their tight linkages, it's natural that their prices will move together, and hence, they form the ideal dog and drunkard pair. An algorithm that can continuously monitor the prices at these two locations will be able to exploit any temporary divergence in prices. By some estimates, if a trading firm can capture the monopoly of exploiting these prices, it stands to make about $20 billion in annual profit. That's $20 billion in annual profit. But how can a firm capture this monopoly? Right? Everything else remaining constant, the firm that is able to communicate the fastest with these two exchanges will have the upper hand. It isn't surprising that this has triggered a new kind of arms race, a race for higher and higher speeds. Trading that happens at exceptionally high speeds is referred to as high-frequency trading. In 2012, Financial Times published a report whereby they said that HFTs account for 84% of trading in U.S. stock market, 84%. Real investors, such as pension funds, mutual funds, hedge funds, brokerage, and other institutional investors accounted for a mere 16%. It's very tempting to identify such prolific growth only with Western markets like U.S. The Indian market, where algorithmic trading was introduced in the year 2008, presents a perfect platform to validate this hypothesis. My co-authors and I have done extensive research on this subject in a project that was sponsored by New York University Stern School and National Stock Exchange of India. We found that as early as 2010, algorithms accounted for 15% of trading in big stocks. Subsequent research shows that the share had increased to 70% by 2013. Within five years, this new breed of traders had captured 70% of the market. Right? The message is loud and clear. Machines dominate trading in markets. This is the new normal. Whether it is India or U.S., machines dominate trading in U.S. markets. Let's next look at a dramatic illustration of how this race for higher and higher speeds has played out in the markets. In his bestseller, Flash Boys, the author Michael Lewis introduces us to Dan Spivey, a trader based out of Chicago. Like other traders, he was very frustrated with the poor transmission speeds provided by the traditional carriers. How bad was it, you may wonder. In 2007, it took 16 milliseconds for a signal 
to do a two-way trip between Chicago and New Jersey. Let's put that number in perspective, right? A blink of a human eye takes 300 to 400 milliseconds. 1,000 milliseconds is one second, right? So by the time we blink our eye, a signal would have made 20 round trips between Chicago and New Jersey. We might find this positively baffling, but the traders found it woefully inadequate, right? So Spivey sensed a business opportunity. If he could find a faster way of communicating data between these locations, the speed bandits would pay him a handsome reward. So he started a telecommunication firm. The name of the firm was Spread Networks, and his objective was to build as straight a line as possible between these two locations. Why? Because when Spivey started examining the cable routes of the carriers, he found that there are a lot of places where the routes were not straight. That makes sense, right? If you have mountains or rivers, the cables have to go around them and not through them. However, these twists and turns greatly result in drop of transmission speed. So Spivey decided to build as straight a line as possible. It meant literally blasting holes through the mountains and digging tunnels under the riverbed, which he did. Finally, Spivey had a line through which he could transmit a two-way signal within 13 milliseconds, right? So if you're anchoring yourself in the eye blink world, we went from one by 20th of an eye blink to one by 25th of an eye blink. Mind boggling, right? So how much did it cost Spivey to build this golden line? $300 million, just so that HFT traders could shave off three milliseconds or one by hundredth of an eye blink. The arms race was truly on. Despite this high stake race, the beauty about HFT was that they managed to stay away from the public spotlight for a very long time. That is until the day of the flash crash. Suddenly, the acronym HFT started popping up everywhere, and the Google search for the keyword HFT went through the roof. That's what we do when we don't know something, right? We just go ahead and Google, right? So everybody started looking what HFT was. But what actually did happen on that day? At 2.32 p.m., a mutual fund group, not a HFT, remember, sent a huge sell order to the market. Due to the intense selling pressure, the prices started falling. Initially, HFTs viewed this as a temporary aberration and started buying. But when the prices continued to fall, they sold whatever they had bought earlier. Some of them continued to aggressively sell, and some decided to stop trading. As a result, there was hardly any buyer in the market, and the market tanked. So here is a remarkable statistic. Between 2.45.13 p.m. and 2.45.27 p.m., a total of 14 seconds, HFTs traded about 27,000 contracts, or roughly 2,000 contracts per second, or 1,000 contracts per I blink, right? What was the role of the HFTs in this crash? This is where a lot of ambiguity is, and that's why we need proper research to educate us. A recent paper by researchers from MIT and University of Maryland, among other schools, summarizes it nicely. They say, while HFTs did not cause the flash crash, they contributed to it due to their excessive trading. This is not semantics, right? This is not a trivial case of potatoes, potatoes, tomatoes, tomatoes. It's a sharp difference between what they did and what they were believed to have done. Now, <clears throat> so what is the learning? What have we learned in the past six years? Here is what we have learned. Algorithm specifically HFTs, dominate trading in most markets. That's the new normal. As the, as the flash crash demonstrated, this new normal, unfortunately, is inherently unstable. The billion dollar, dollar question, or should we say the trillion dollar question is, how do we improve the stability of these markets? Researchers, regulators, policymakers, exchanges have thrown their hats in the ring. Unfortunately, we still do not have a definite answer. Until we find an answer, we can only hope that when every time HFTs go on a rampage like this, we somehow manage to doze off. This was 23rd April 2013. And around 107 
on that day, the markets witnessed a micro crash, losing about $200 billion in investors' wealth. What happened on that day? On that day, the Associated Press Twitter account was hacked so. Right? The trading algorithms read the fake tweet, didn't realize that the tweet was fake, started selling, and the market crashed. All of this happened within one minute. All of this happened before Associated Press realized that its account was hacked. Right? So, in summary, right, in the olden days, what would that trader have done? The trader would have just picked up the telephone and asked, hey, did they really bomb the White House? But now, by the time the trader picks up the phone, unlocks the screen, dials the number, and says, hey, a gazillion orders would have gone to the exchange. This sure is a crazy, a fast world out there. Thank you.